Now it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Charles E. Young is Chancellor Emeritus and Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. He was UCLA Chancellor from 1968 to 1997. So that's uh, 29 years, 28, It's a lot of years. <laughs> and President of the University of Florida from 1999 to 2004, that's five years, I know that. In recent years, he has served as CEO of the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, and as President of the Goddard Foundation. He's a former chairman of the prestigious American Association of Universities and has served on, on numerous educational commissions and corporate boards of directors, including semiconductor giant Intel. Dr. Young received his BA in honors in political science from UCR in 1955. UCR in 1955, that is to say. And was UCR's first student body president. He earned MA and PhD degrees from political science from UCLA. Please join me in welcoming Chancellor Emeritus Charles E. Young. Undercover chancellor, <laughs> deans, uh, administrators, faculty, ladies and gentlemen in the class of 2012. Uh, I first of all want to thank uh, all of you, those present and those perhaps not, who are responsible for my having the great honor and privilege of addressing you here today. As you know from the program, as well as now the introduction, those of you who are graduating today will be fellow alumni of mine on the receipt of your degrees this morning. You may be wondering how someone as old as I can be a graduate of a university so young as UCR. Indeed, our university is by any standards quite young, having opened its doors to approximately 115 students in the winter of 1954, only 58 years ago. Hard as it may be for you to believe, I can prove that I was here on that historic date. My name is carved in that concrete block which keeps moving around the campus as space is needed for more buildings. To save you the trouble, I will tell you that my age at that time, when added to the intervening years, comes up to 80. So I am indeed relatively long in the tooth and prepared to take advantage of that older status in making these comments today. You also know that I have spent most of the post-war, the post-UCR years as Chancellor of UCLA or President of the University of Florida, 35 years in all. So you might quite rightly suppose that I have officiated at many events such as these and in the process been subjected to more commencement addresses than I care to remember. They, like those I have read about or read this year, ranged all over the map from nostalgic reminiscences to clarion calls to action. This year, there was even one which focused on convincing the graduates that they were not, contrary to what they, their parents and friends believed, special. As I thought about the thrust of my talk, I was torn between those same two extremes of maudlin meanderings and manipulative manifesto which I had heard so many times in the past. Though I never paid any attention or gave any thought to the you are common theme, because I know that you indeed are not. You are graduates of UCR, and therefore special indeed. But caught between the horn, horns of that dilemma between nostalgia and call to action, I was unable to make a clear-cut decision to stick with one and exclude the other. Therefore, you will have to suffer through a bit of both those well-known topics during this discussion. I have striven, however, to, in putting these thoughts to paper to be as brief as possible so that we can get on to what you're all here for, which is certainly not to hear me ramble on indefinitely. It was great to be at UCR in the beginning. 
It was not only a new campus of the University of California, but a new concept. A liberal arts college and a public university system composed at that time of real or fledgling research universities. While large in its audacity, the audacity of its vision, it was small in the numbers of students. I had several classes compo com composed of me on one side of the classroom and a first-rate faculty member on the other. Lack of preparation was not a possible embarrassment. It was a certain disaster. But the learning experience in that environment was and remains hard to replicate. I had the honor, as you've heard, of being the first student body president, therefore helping to set in motion a collaborative relationship among students, faculty, and administration, which persists, I am sure, to this day. I and my fellow students chose the Highlander name, turning down, among others, Kawata Mundi, which was championed by my good friend Ernie Garcia. I was able to head off the spelling of Highlander with an H-Y instead of H-I-G-H, which I hope has been appreciated by subsequent generations. With my two best friends, Bud Barton, who was president of the senior class, and Jim St. Clair, who was the first editor of the Highlander, I was responsible for selecting the location and laying out the size and shape of the future Big C which after many, many uh, renovations over the years, rises still on the hill behind the campus. During the first days of class in the winter of 1954, we did indeed walk between buildings on two by eight planks laid down over mud from torrential rain. I could go on forever in this vein, but I promise to be brief. The most important part of that UCR experience was that I received, as have you, a great education. An education that enabled me with ease to, to a graduate program, in, to move with ease to a graduate program in political science at UCLA serving in, in my first semester as a graduate student, as a teaching assistant, and working in that capacity and as a research assistant for most of the time I spent working toward my PhD in political science. All of this graduate experience was built on the foundation I received as an undergraduate at UCR and led to faculty positions at UC Davis and UCLA, an increasingly responsible administrative experience, which led to my selection as chancellor of my second alma mater in 1968 at the age of 36. I have reported all of this post-UCR experience not to qualify you as my biographers, but to provide a transition to the manifesto I promised. While there are a number of causes, many more than my wife would prefer, which keep me busily engaged at my ripe old age, among them political inanity, media, mediocrity, and reform of intercollegiate athletics, my call to you is to help repay the university which provided you like me with an education of the highest quality by helping it be able to maintain and indeed enhance that quality. That is the goal at which I have labored most of my life, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. I can assure you that it has been for me and will be for you an effort worth, the, the challenge worth the effort. I mentioned earlier that I became chancellor of UCLA in 1968, having been appointed by the regents the day after Bobby Kennedy's assassination. I had the great opportunity, 
during the first few years of my term to serve in a time of great crisis and change in the university world, in the United States, and indeed the world at large. As the students of that generation helped bring the realities of the civil rights movement and the insanities of the Vietnam War into the American mainstream. In the process of those changes, they helped change the world and their university. Now, one of the changes of which I am most proud was the increased diversity of the student body, which I fought so hard along with students and others to bring about, and a change which is seen nowhere more clearly than at UCR. Now, now another crisis faces us. And you must, as did your predecessors, take up the challenge. Your university, along with its sisters in the UC system and most public universities across the nation, are under attack. The attacks are not always overt, Indeed, they are not usually overt, but covert and often as a result of inaction rather than action. The major effect of this attack has been drastic reductions in the level of funding of these great institutions. For a variety of reasons, which I will not take the time to comment on today, the situation in California is the worst in the nation. The actions or inactions which have brought about these budgetary crises are usually covered with the mantle of reducing a bloated budget, cutting deficits, or reducing the size of that Tea Party bogeyman, evil big government. These clearly harmful actions are based, I am afraid, in part on the notion that a college education is now primarily, if not wholly, an individual rather than a common good, as we have had assumed for so long, and rightly so. You must, in response to, the, to, these, to, to this crisis, as I said before, take up the cause as your predecessors did in response to the crises of their time. You and your fellow graduates around the state and nation are uniquely qualified to defend your alma maters in this battle. See, I told you you were special. You must fathom the root causes of these attacks and the reason for their success. The so-called news media will not be terribly helpful, especially with the increasing demise of the printed press and the growing loss of viewership by the old network news establishments. Unfortunately, these previously important and mainly objective sources have been and are being replaced by growth in leader, re, viewership and readership of the so-called cable news outlets, and even worse, the blogs, the first of which is focused not on news but entertainment, and the second of which is, for the most part, totally devoid of editorial or other devices to give credibility to what is written. So you must be very careful about what you believe from what you read and what you see. You also must be prepared to get through the fluff to the facts and to support new approaches to university funding and governance issues along with the other kinds of concerns. Be prepared to look to do things that have not been done before. Especially when, as been the case for some time now, the old methods have been shown unworkable in the current context. For instance, it is clear that begging the governor or the legislature of California to provide more funds in the face of the impediments that have been placed in their way is futile. Now, I could, but I will not try to enlist you in pursuing my particular answers to the, to the, uh, uh, to the question of appropriate solutions to the problem I presented. 
My diagnosis and prescription are somewhat counterintuitive and difficult for most to accept, although the proposal presented by the UCR students to the regents when they met here fairly recently comes closer than most to what I would like to see happen. The important thing is not to, to do what I think needs to be done, but to, for you to commit yourselves to the task of, of helping to bring this university back to the level it should be and keeping it there and keeping it moving forward. I'm convinced that if you take that step with the preparation that you have received by our alma mater, you will find a path that will help lead to the solution of your university's potentially disastrous problems. Uh, I, I, you will have, a, have, if you succeed, helped the, those who are responsible for, for the governance of universities, this and others, to understand that quality education at all levels, for those who can benefit from it, is what made this country the world leader it became in the post-World War II era, and that its future success and leadership depends on that uh, reliance now. Now, as you pursue the goal I have asked you to follow, I believe you will have come to identify clearly other challenges to our political and social system, which must be taken up. Challenges which threaten our well-being as a nation and society, and therefore deserve your attention. You can help to return the commitment of our political leaders to a society that, while incentivizing extraordinary achievement by providing those responsible for success with much of the fruits of their effort, does not equate prosperity with the greater wealth, prosperity with, the, with greater wealth for the already wealthy at the expense of those not so fortunate. A society and a government which provides medical care for all its citizens a condition found today in all other industrialized societies. A, a society and a government which understand that, understands that those in true need deserve care and comfort and help to be able to stand on their own feet. A, a society and government that recognizes that government, big or small, serving its true function is to be supported and not vilified. A society which understands that the way to increase governmental revenues, despite Ronald Reagan's adoption of the Laffer curve, to meet vital community services is not cutting taxes on the rich in the hope that the benefits derived by them will trickle down to the rest of society and a society and government which rejects the notion that elections are to be bought by those capable of spending millions, if not billions of dollars on that effort. <laughs> Need I do more than call to your attention the defeat of a proposition on the, on the June ballot, which would have taxed cigarettes more greatly than they had been in order to reduce the amount of smoking and thereby save thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of lives and millions and millions of dollars in our society. In short, if you recognize and act upon these other problems that I am sure you will see, you will have contributed not only to the educational tenets of the Young Manifesto, but to those others relating to media mediocrity and political inanity. Now that still leaves intercollegiate athletic reform uncovered. But that is something I'll hold for another commencement address, if indeed after this performance I am ever asked again. Congratulations and good luck, fellow alumni.